and welcome to St. Andrew's Presbyterian Church here in Fredericton, New Brunswick. Leading worship today are Annika Frazier and Richard Graham. Our musicians are soloist Christina Blum and our music director, David Berry. Our storytellers are Lucy and Dr. Thomas Good. And I am the Reverend Susan Brazier. Let us worship God. The heavens are telling of the glory of God. With the whole firmament, let us proclaim God's handiwork. The law of the Lord revives the soul. May God's teaching bring us wisdom in our worship. Let the words of our mouths and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable to you, O God, for you are our rock and our redeemer. So let us praise you with all we have. saw your children as slaves in Egypt and brought them to freedom. You see creation held captive by our desire for more and more and weep. And so you're, you pour out your foolish love on us from day to day. All that we have learned and think we know has not brought meaning to our lives. The brokenness of our world needs your peace. The pain shattered hearts need your healing. And so you speak to us through the mouth of your servant, Jesus. All creation weeps with grief and cries to you for comfort. All the brokenness of our world long for your holiness. All who hunger for hope long for your sweetness of your grace and joy. And so you fill us with spirit and the wisdom of you. Amen. Dr. Yes. what is a prophet? Oh, a prophet. Now, see, a prophet is a person who brings a message from God to the people. Sometimes it's a message to encourage them, sometimes it's a message to warn them. But why do you ask? Oh, because I was reading about the prophet Jeremiah, ah. and it says that God appointed him to be a prophet to the nations Yes. before he was even Born. Oh yes, Lucy, that's right. And in fact, Jeremiah worked a very long time from when he was young for over 40 years oh, and under hey. five different kings. Five kings? Yes. And wow. unlike some prophets, we actually know a lot about Jeremiah's life. Really? Yes, yes. Like, like, do we know where he grew up? 
Yes, he grew up in a little town, but he did all of his prophesying down in Judah in the big city of Jerusalem. Jerusalem? Yes. So does that make him a come from away like me? <laughs> well, yes, Lucy, I guess he was a come from away. <laughs> but, but do we know anything else? Like, like, like maybe did he have a best friend? Yes, he had a best buddy, Baruch. Baruch? Yep, and Baruch and Jeremiah did all kinds of things together. Um, Baruch even helped Jeremiah to write down his poetry and his stories and his prophecy in his book. Oh, they did group work. Yeah. I love group projects, Dr. Tom. <laughs> Do you? Fun. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, Dr. Tom, yes. how did Jeremiah know how to be a prophet if he was just a little boy? You know, oh. I think it would be very hard to take God's messages and tell them to a bunch of adults. I would be very scared. You know, Lucy, that's exactly what Jeremiah said to God when God yeah. first called him. He said, I'm just a boy. And God said, go anyway. <gasps> and so then Jeremiah said, well, I wouldn't know what to say. And God touched his mouth and put the words right in his mouth. Right, right. Yes. Right in his mouth? <laughs> yes. Oh my gosh. Well, but, but Dr. Tom, yeah. I think it's easier probably to get out of cleaning your room for your mom than getting out of working for God. But you know, Lucy, working for God as a priest or a prophet was sort of the family business for Jeremiah. Oh. His father was a priest, and his cousin Holda, she was a very well-known prophet too. Women were prophets too? Of course there were women prophets. There were lots of women prophets. Since prophecy was kind of the family business, of course, they made sure that he had a good education so that he could be a good prophet. Dr. Mm -hmm. Tom, I don't think that Jeremiah liked being a prophet. Oh. People were mean to him, mm -hmm. and you know, Dr. Tom, Yes. Jeremiah complained all the time. <laughs> yeah. You know, he was... Dr. Tom, yeah. he was a whiner, but... Oh, Lucy, <laughs> yes. He was, he, he was. was. He was treated badly, and he, okay, he was a whiner. Yes. And in, in fact, he's called the weeping prophet. Oh. But I think, Lucy, I think the hardest part for him was that the people didn't want to hear God's message. Like, when I don't want to hear my mom tell me to clean my room, and I just want to go outside yes. and play. Yes, it's like that, Lucy. The people did not want to hear, especially, what they were doing wrong. And they were doing a lot of things wrong. Jeremiah must have been so discouraged. Even though he complained a lot, the surprising thing is that he was still quite optimistic. Really? Yes. He worked in extremely difficult times. There was a big war, and there was a famine, and yet, even in the midst of all of that suffering, he told the people that this is what God said. For I know, for I know the, plans the plans I have. For I know the plans I have for you. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. Hope and a future. I like that, Dr. Tom. I do too. Plans to give you a hope. Plans to give you a hope. Hope and a future. Hope and a future. For I know. For I know. The plans. The plans. I have. God of wisdom, you have spoken in the law and the prophets to teach us how to live. Move in and among us through your Holy Spirit to open our minds and hearts to your truth and receive your life-giving word. Amen. 
The uh, Old Testament reading is from Jeremiah, the seventh chapter, first 11 verses. The word came to Jeremiah from the Lord. Stand in the gate of the Lord's house and proclaim there this word and, and say, Hear the word of the Lord, all you people of Judah, you, you that enter the, these gates to worship the Lord. Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, amend your ways and your doings and let me dwell with you in this place. Do not trust in these deceptive words. This is the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord. For if you truly amend your ways and your doings, if you truly act justly with one another, if you do not oppress the alien, the orphan, and the widow, or shed innocent blood in this place, and if you do not go after other gods to your own hurt, then I will dwell with you in this place, in the land that I gave of old to your ancestors forever and ever. Here you are, trusting in deceptive words to no avail. Will you steal, murder, commit adultery, swear falsely, make offerings to Baal, and go after other gods that you have not known? And then come and stand before me in this house, which is called by my name, and say, we are safe, only to go on doing all these abominations. Has this house, which is called by my name, become a den of robbers in your sight? You know, I too am watching, says the Lord. To the leader, a psalm of David. The heavens are telling the glory of God, and the earth proclaims his handiwork. Day to day pours forth speech, and night to night declares knowledge. There is no speech, nor are there words. Their voice is not heard. Yet their voice goes through all the earth, and the words go to the end of the world. In the heavens he has set a tent for the sun, which comes out like a bride's groom from his wedding canopy. And like a strong man runs its course with joy, its rising is from the end of the heavens, and its circuit to the end of them. There is nothing hid from its heat. The law of the Lord is perfect, revealing the soul. The decrees of the Lord are sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is clear, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. The laws of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired than gold, even much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and the droppings of the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is your servant warned. In keeping them there is great reward. But who can distract their errors? Clear me from hidden faults. Keep back your servant also from the insolent. Do not let them have dominion over me. Then I shall be blameless and innocent of great transgression. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable to you, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. The New Testament reading is for, for 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 1, verses 18 to 25. For the message above the cross is foolishness for those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made this, made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom, God decided through the foolishness of our proclamation to save those who believe. For Jews demand signs and Greeks desire wisdom, but we proclaim Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews. 
foolishness to the Gentiles, but to those who are called both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. For God's foolishness is wiser than human wisdom, and God's strength is stronger than human strength. Every Sunday I stand here before you and I ask you to pray with me before I deliver the sermon. I engage in this ritual prayer because it is my desperate desire that God will use me, my breath, my voice, my very being to bring to each of you the message the Almighty wants you, no, needs you to hear. I pray that you'll receive the message either because of me or some Sundays in spite of me. Most ministers offer a prayer before they preach using many different words. But I am deeply fond of the ancient words the psalmist added, almost as a postscript, to the end of Psalm 19 that we heard Annika read for us this morning. For three millennia, people of faith have prayed this prayer. I ask you to join me once more. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Our gospel lesson this morning comes from the 19th chapter of Luke, verses 45 and 46. Listen now for the word of God. When Jesus entered the temple, he began to drive out those who were selling things there. And he said, it is written, my house shall be a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of robbers. This is a word of God for the people of God. Well, Luke's account is pretty uh, succinct, a little devoid of details, don't you think? You know this story well, the cleansing of the temple, but let's pause for a moment and fill in some of the gaps. Uh, let's phone a friend, let's read from John's Gospel, chapter 2, 13 through 22. Listen again for the word of God. The Passover of the Jews was near, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple, he found people selling cattle and sheep and doves, and the money changers seated at their tables. Making a whip of cords, he drove them out of the temple, both the sheep and the cattle. He also poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned tables. He told those who were selling doves, Take these things out of here. Stop making my father's house a marketplace. His disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for your house will consume me. The Jews then said to him, what sign can you show us for doing this? Jesus answered them, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews then said, this temple has been under construction for 46 years, and you will raise it up in three days? But he was speaking about the temple of his body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scriptures and the word that Jesus had spoken. This, too, is a word of God. Thanks be to God. The author of John's Gospel is not nearly as stingy with the details as a writer of Luke's Gospel. John provides rich details of the scene. Merchants bustle among their animals, money changers busily changing coins, and pilgrims peruse the stalls bartering with the tradespeople and seeking priests to complete sacrificial rituals. Money changers exchange denarii into half shekels so the pilgrims could pay the temple tax while well, animals were offered in sacrifice for ritual purity from daily life so that they could participate fully in the Passover. Although certainly different, the scene in the second chapter of John is not entirely unlike Christians as we prepare for Easter. Believers gather in a holy place, remembering God's deliverance and seeking to honor God through ritual and repentance. As you know, there is a small group engaged in a Lenten Bible study here on Tuesday evenings. We have been using the book, Entering the Passion of Jesus, A Beginner's Guide, 
to Holy Week, written by Professor of New Testament Studies at Vanderbilt Divinity School, Dr. A.J. Levine. I want to share with you this morning how this historical Jesus scholar understands the encounter of Jesus at the Great Temple of Jerusalem. Dr. Levine writes, the incident known as the cleansing of the temple is described in all four gospels. Most people have the idea, probably from Hollywood, that, there's, that this is a huge disruption. When we see this scene depicted in movies, we find Jesus fuming with anger and we inevitably see gold coins falling in slow motion. Everything in the temple comes to a standstill. Not all movies actually have Jesus speaking at this moment, perhaps because they think his actions are, at least here, more important than words. Perhaps because if they included both what he said in the synoptics as well as what he says in John, the incident would become confusing or maybe too long. But we are not here watching a movie. We are studying the Gospels. Here is what we know about the actual setting. We begin by noting that the temple complex was enormous. It was the size of 12 soccer fields put end to end. So if Jesus turns over a table or two in one part of the complex, it's not going to make any difference given the size of the space. The action, therefore, did not stop all the business. It's symbolic rather than practical. One responsibility is to determine what was symbolized. For that, we need to know how the temple functioned. The Jerusalem temple, which King Herod the Great began to rebuild and which was still under construction at the time of Jesus, had several different courts. The inner sanctum was known as the Holy of Holies, is where the high priest entered only on Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, to ask forgiveness for himself and for the people. Outside of that was the court of the priests, then the court of Israel, the court of the women, and then the court of the Gentiles, who were welcome in the temple. The outer court, the court of the Gentiles, is where the vendors sold their goods. The temple at that time, at the temple at the time of Jesus, was many things. It was a house of prayer for all nations, it was a site for the three pilgrimage festivals of Passover, Shabbat, and Sukkot. It was a symbol of Jewish tradition. It was a national bank. It was the only place in the Jewish world where sacrifices could be offered. Therefore, there needed to be vendors on site, pilgrims who would offer doves, such as Mary and Joseph do in the following the birth of Jesus, according to Luke, or a sheep for Passover meal, would not bring the animals with them when they came from Galilee or Egypt or Damascus. They would not risk the animal becoming injured and so unfit. The animals also might fly or wander away or be stolen or die. One bought one's offering from these vendors. Next, we need to think that the temple was something other than what we think of as churches. A church usually is a place of quiet and decorum. The temple was something much different. It was a tourist attraction, especially during the festival season. It was very crowded and it was noisy. The noise was loud and boisterous because they were celebrating Passover. The people were happy because they were celebrating the Feast of Freedom. For many, it was one of the few opportunities to celebrate by eating meat rather than just fish. Uh, we might think of it as a setting, something like a vacation for the pilgrims, a chance to leave their homes, to catch up with friends and relatives, to see the big city, to feel the special connection with their fellow Jews and with God. It is into this setting that Jesus comes. As you can see, Professor Levine is a very good writer and if you are intrigued, you are more than welcome to join us Tuesday evenings over Zoom, even if you don't have time to read the book. So here's what I wonder. If the merchant vendors and money exchangers are 
all providing a valuable integral service for the temple and for the pilgrims alike, why does Jesus create such a ruckus? The money changers, the merchants selling doves and cattle were all just engaged in, in commerce. Certainly it was just good business. Some of the proceeds probably went to help support the, the temple coffers, making the very existence of the temple possible. Jesus doesn't even attempt to negotiate or give warning. He just barges in, no announcement, and starts flipping tables and yielding a whip and creating chaos. You have to imagine there was a feeling of, hey, what do we do? We bring benefit and value. If we leave, who's going to pay the bills? Do you think a bunch of peasants are going to maintain the upkeep of this temple and pay for the priests? I think Jesus might have been dismayed by the infusion of the secular world into the sacred space. The free market economy, bartering, buying, selling, making profit. Maybe how humans choose to run their societies and control their government. But this is not God's way, and it does not belong in the sanctified space of the Holy Temple. The Bible repeatedly invites us to imagine a world where sharing is the norm and where God provides. Listen to the words of the prophet Isaiah. Come, all who are thirsty, come to the waters, and you without money, come, buy, eat. Come, buy wine and milk without money and without cost. Why spend money on that which is not bread and your labor on that which does not satisfy? Listen to me and eat what is good and your soul will delight in the richest foods. Having spent decades involved in commerce as a trial lawyer, this strikes me as so foolish, so out of touch with reality. Being careful with the resources God gives us, using all of our human wisdom garnered through NBA classes and decades of experience, all demand that we act prudently. But our ways are not God's ways. In God's hands, even the horrific execution on the cross becomes a gift for our salvation. God's ways are not our ways, and trusting God and where God is leading is what it means to be disciples of Christ. The incident at the temple, the, the cleansing of the temple, represents perhaps that commerce as usual has no place in Christ's kingdom. Commerce as usual with the notions of buyer beware, exploiting workers, taking advantage of the economic situation to the detriment of others, is just wrong in God's holy temple. But such conduct is not only wrong in sacred space, but is also wrong in the secular world as well. It is not about whether something is lawful or allowed under the law of the realm. It is about whether it is honorable before God. The prophet Jeremiah writes, Will you steal, murder, commit adultery, swear falsely, making offerings to Baal, and go after other gods that you have not known, and then come and stand before me in this house, which is called by my name, and say, we are safe, only to go on doing these abominations? Has this house, which is called by my name, become a den of robbers in your sight? A den of robbers. A den of robbers is not where robbers carry out their crimes. It is a place where they gather comfortable and safe. In the very brief account from the Gospel of Luke, Jesus quotes this passage from Jeremiah. My house shall be called a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of robbers. As a church, as a holy people of God, we are called to trust God, even though it might seem foolish, and we are called to embody Christ's ethics of being fair and honorable in everything we do, even when we are not in the sanctuary. Of everyone here, 
I probably struggle to live my life by these guidelines more than anyone else. I struggle to ignore the demands of our market-driven economy and the pursuit of advantage. I struggle to trust that with God and through God, there will be enough. But it is to this life that we are called as a followers of Christ. Amen. Loving God, we thank you for the world you created and the opportunities we have to enjoy its beauty and its life-sustaining promise. When we find occasions to breathe in fresh air and exercise outdoor this winter, remind us of our partnership with you to care for creation. As spring comes closer and the sun shines longer each day, reawaken our hope in your promise of new life to sustain us as the weeks of the pandemic stretch on. Ever-present God, we thank you for walking with us through the days of uncertainty as well as in times of pleasure and satisfaction. In times of risk and stress, you provide a still point of calm. In times of challenge, you are the source of courage and confidence for us. Thank you for hearing our prayers when we pray and for the wisdom and encouragement we receive from you. This day, we pray for those who are struggling with the isolation and frustration the pandemic means for so many. Bring them peace and patience with your love. We pray for churches whose common life has been changed by so much, by months of distancing. Keep us strong in faith and fellowship so that we may serve as agents of healing and hope in our communities. We pray for our nation and the nations of the world. May leaders confront the challenges of this time with wisdom, courage, and compassion. We pray for the innocent victims of violence around the world. Work through advocates for peace with justice 
to bring change where it is needed and daily bread to those whose lives and livelihoods have been disrupted. And we pray for those who are enduring pain and illness, those who are facing grief and loss, and those who work on the front lines of our community in healthcare, education, retail, emergency, and in public service. So many are exhausted by these months of the pandemic. Be their comfort and their encouragement day by day, dear Lord. Hear us now as we pray together using the words that Jesus taught us. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Go out into the world in peace. Have courage. Hold on to that which is good. Return no one evil for evil. Strengthen the faint-hearted. Support the weak. Help the suffering. Honor all people. Love and serve the Lord, rejoicing in the Holy Spirit. And now, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord cause his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. Mm -hmm.